welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Karina Buzo. Come over here yeah. so they can see you. Um, What's up? What's up? <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I'm going to introduce her. She has a bachelor's degree, of course, in women and gender studies with a concentration in sociology and a queer studies minor, which I had forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, and graduated in 2013. Then she went on to complete her master's degree in um, education and college student services at OSU or Oregon State University and graduated there from 2015, mm -hmm. right on time. And then you returned to the hub to work here um, for two years as the program coordinator for the campus life uh, at, hub, at the hub. And then went back to OSU when you got into their PhD program. And uh, you were also, however, working full time the first year Plus, yeah, you yeah, talk about that um, as the assistant director of diversity initiatives and programs. And then beginning this fall, she has stopped that job, mm -hmm. and you are now a full time PhD student at Oregon State in the department of. Tell me what the department is. I don't have it done. Um, I'm not sure. Let me see. What do you have? Women, Gender, Sexuality is that Studies. It? Yeah, that's what's called within the College of Liberal Arts. Okay, Women, Gender, and Sexuality <coughs> Studies yeah. in the College of Liberal Arts. Yeah, very cool. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you. You just gave like half my speech, so it's perfect. <laughs> um, I won't have to say much. Um, yes, my name is Karina. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I've done this big yo-yo thing, um, boomerang, whatever you prefer, of being at Sonoma State University, Oregon State University, Sonoma State University, Oregon State University, and what's up, I'm here today. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from Stockton, California, um, which is in the Central Valley. Um, it's super brown and black, really low income, um, high violence, which I didn't realize until I left and came to Sonoma State where everyone else had a lot of ideas about what Stockton was. Um, and I had no idea. Um, I actually started out as a math major and I thought I was gonna be a seventh grade math teacher because my seventh grade math teacher was amazing. And I thought I could be just like her. I was also pretty good at math, you know, pretty cool. Um, but I think coming to Sonoma State and having the uh, culture shock of a predominantly white institution for the first time in my life, I didn't realize that there were that many white people in the world. Like, I didn't realize there were that many of one kind of person in the world. And at the time, I don't know if this is how it's so set up, but summer orientation was set up so that you went with similar majors to you. And the math department on top of Sonoma's regular, right, like regular demographics was very white, very um, men. And it just wasn't a demographic I'm used to as somebody who comes from like a very brown, loud woman kind of community and family. And it was just a shock. And I realized that uh, I would be doing more than just going to school. You know, as a first generation college student, I thought that going to college was just like going to the next grade. <laughs> like, you know, you go from elementary school to middle school, you go from middle school to high school, and then you just go to high school to college. I thought it was just gonna be a new place to go to classes that you just like lived there. Um, I didn't realize how much learning would happen outside of the classroom. And because of the GE requirements, I ended up taking a intro to sociology class, the intro to sociology class. I took it um, and was like, oh, I'm gonna be a statistics and sociology major. And then I found the, um, the queer studies lecture series. I was actually dating somebody who was in the class and she was always like, come with me. It's really cool, I promise you'll love it. And then so I just like, um, I just like crashed class all the time. I was like, this is amazing. Um, I kept thinking she was saying career studies, and I was like, I don't know, I'm sure why we're doing this. Um, <laughs> she was saying queer studies. Um, and, and so I would go, and I fell in love with it, and I was like, oh yeah, I need to get in on this. I need to do this. Um, my admiration and desire for, I didn't know, I didn't have this language yet, but like gender studies, feminist studies, was like long in formation, like middle school. Um, in middle school, I had this seventh, eighth grade English teacher named Miss Walden, who was a really nice white lady lesbian, and I loved Miss Walden. She was my homie, and we did like these things where we would write journals, and then at the end of the week, she would collect them, and then you know write cute notes in them as nice white lady teachers do, <laughs> um, um, to predominantly brown you know students and freedom writers thing. Um, and she would write notes to us, and I regularly talked about how I was perceiving gender and sexuality around me, specifically with peers who were being bullied um, because of their perceived gender or sexuality. But I didn't, I didn't have that language, right? I was like, so-and-so is getting made fun of for being a, being a girl. 
but they were a boy. I was trying to make sense of it. Uh, Miss Walden ended up giving me this book called um, Luna by Julianne Peters, which is about a young trans girl written from the perspective of her sister. Um, and it was it was the newest thing I had ever learned. I I was immediately enthralled, and I had um, finished the book and went home and told my parents I wanted to be a gender lawyer. Um, because that's the only language I was just like, I need to advocate. I, oh my God, like, how do people not know about this? This is amazing. And they didn't know anything either, right? They never went to college. They're like brown and hardworking, and um, they didn't have any experience with what gender was or what I was asking for, but they knew advocacy. So they took me to the library and asked the librarian to show me how to find books that I wanted. And they took me and they took me to take them back. And they sat with me in the library, right? They never rushed me. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with my parents growing up in the 60s and experiencing violent racial desegregation stuff. Um, my mom had to violently learn English in the third grade after being born in Texas. I don't think that's a narrative that gets discussed often is that my mom is a U.S. born citizen who was born in Texas but didn't learn English till the third grade because a lot of the border cities in Texas are just like Mexican cities because this was Mexico. Okay. Um, so she spoke Spanish and then her family moved to California in the third grade where she was required to violate, like, and it was violence, right, because you could hit kids then. Um, um, to learn English in one year. And she experienced that. My dad um, experienced a lot of similar things around school. And so when I was their age, right, racial justice was always age appropriate because they had experienced those things from a really young age. Um, so as young as the third grade for me, if I came home with a note, you know, stapled to my jacket or like whatever happens to little kids, you know, or I get like the yellow card in school, um, they would ask the gender and race of the teacher. Right? They were like, who is your teacher? Tell me more. Because they wanted that context. And even though they didn't have, they never said racial justice, right? They never said those things. They wanted to know those questions, and I think that's where it comes from. And that's what led me to Sonoma State. Um, and it's what led me to eventually switching my major. A lot of people, uh, when my peers especially heard that I was trying, uh, eventually switching my major from a math major to statistics to WGS, sociology and queer studies. They were like, aren't your parents pissed off? And I was like, no, like my parents are just really excited I'm in college. <laughs> um, they're really excited I'm in college. They have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and they, I've been talking about being a gender lawyer since I was like 12, right? So they're just like, yeah, sure, do whatever you want. Um, and get a degree. Um, and I think that, that narrative too around getting a job, I think is probably really imperative for folks in this course of like, why, why didn't I know if I wanted to be a gender lawyer by middle school? And um, I, was, uh, I was in a performing arts program. Mm, we went to like a performing arts magnet school. My sister and I said we because my little sister is here. Um, and where everybody's fourth period was like your performing arts. And so I was in theater. And um, my theater teacher introduced me to the Vagina Monologues, like the book. And I was so obsessed with it that my theater nickname ended up being Karina the Vagina. Because it's all I would talk about. I was like, oh my god, why don't more people know about this, right? Um, eventually came to Sonoma State, and then I was in Vagina Monologues by freshman year, but hadn't switched majors until at least junior year, right? So this idea of like, how come I didn't know what was, what was being built around me that didn't um, show me that being, having a career or a life in feminist studies or in gender studies or whatever that language is that you kind of want to capture um, wasn't a possibility, right? I was still a math major at the time. I was still trying to, um, I was still adhering to something that had to do with a statistics major, right? Like I was like, I still need this um, kind of qualifier behind what I was doing. Once I graduated at about junior year, no, even before, I would say about junior year, I had an idea that I wanted to do, um, how do I say it? A part of me coming to Sonoma State, predominantly white institution, that summer, the entire summer orientation team was white. Um, and then I ended up joining the cheer squad and that was all white. Um, and so a part of me, being here and experiencing this campus was I want to be all of those things because I want people to see me and think that they belong here too. Like that was very active. Like um, somebody who talks too fast and like cusses and is from where I'm from. I want people to see that this is this is something they could do. Um, and so I ended up getting really involved and I was a CSA. I did some 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 stuff with some orientation and I also experienced a lot. Um, I ended up uh, as a CSA. One of my uh, I one of my students ended up dying by suicide that year. 
um, I ended up being sexually harassed by my own residents. Um, and the, I'm saying these things which are like really heavy things, but it was because I ended up being held by professionals in my life. So like my supervisor, their supervisor, people were taking me places, right? People were checking in on me. And I think there was this moment that I was like, wait, wait, who are you? Like, how, what do you do? How are you doing this? how did you get here, right, the professional staff around me? Um, and I realized they were like, oh, we're student affairs professionals. <laughs> um, we get a master's degree in this. Like, we, you know, there's there's training. Um, and I was like, damn, that's what I want to do, but I want to do it around, like, gender stuff. And that's kind of how things were pieced together for me. So by junior year, um, uh, summer of junior, between junior and senior year, um, I decided to do an internship, a three-month internship, 40 hours a week, doing um, student affairs work for residential education and the Pride Center at University of Connecticut. Um, and I was like, if I could get to these three months, 40 hours a week and still love this work, then this is what I want to do. I'll commit to grad school. Loved it, went to grad school, Oregon State University, College Student Services Administration, focused on intersecting identities at predominantly white institutions. Um, that was my area of study and focus in all of my work. Um, coordinator of Gender and Sexuality at the Hub immediately after that. Um, and what Charlene didn't capture in that timeline was I was actually applying. So what happened is I applied for the PhD at OSU, then I applied for the job at OSU, and then I got the job, and then I got the PhD. <laughs> so, so I really wanted the PhD. The job came up, and, I, and it was working for my mentor from my master's program. And I had told her when I left, like, if you're ever hiring, tell me. Like, this is my dream. Like, working for you and doing this work um, is my dream job. And so I had been working very hard. Um, it sounds like maybe some of y'all read the article that I wrote. That was in preparation for PhD applications, right? Like, it was like a year and a half of prep work before I even applied. And so I had been applying, 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 like, kicking my own ass, right, to, like, feel qualified enough, whether I needed it or not, I didn't. Anyway, anyway that's a whole other conversation. Um, I applied. I applied for the job. I got the job. I got to campus. So I moved to OSU. Uh, to OSU. I moved to Corvallis, Oregon. Um, for the job, and about a month after being there, I got into the PhD program for the following fall. And my supervisor, who's an amazing woman of color, um, was like, I support you to do whatever it is that you need to do. So this last academic year, I did both. I was a PhD student and the Assistant Director of Diversity Initiatives and Programs, um, and it was absolutely exhausting. It was fulfilling work, but it's work that takes 150% of you. and. Um, and the program wasn't made for like working professionals. There's like doctorate programs that are like made for working professionals. This is not it. <laughs> this is not, this is like full classes, four hour classes, multiple days a week with lots and lots of reading. Like it just wasn't. And, and I was attempting to do both and it was exhausting. And uh, luckily I have um, an amazing partner and um, we are both making a lot of sacrifices so that I could go back to school full time. Um, and I feel very fortunate to do that. And now I'm here supplementing my income talking with college students. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna leave off. I have a bunch of questions that I have made bullet points for. Um, I've already addressed some of them. And then I also have a few questions that you all also asked, which I have bullet points for, but anything that I shared so far that you would like to jump in and start asking questions about that will lead me to my next direction. If not, I can jump into questions that I have prepped. Anywhere you'd like me to begin? No? Okay, I will start. Let's see. Okay, so what have I been up to? Um, let's see, Some in addition to some of the, like, what am I doing as an assistant director of diversity initiatives, in case you wanna know, like, what kind of jobs these look like, I get and like how WGS informed those things. Um, I was coordinating um, a student program that, um, that, was a social justice peer educator program. So um, I supervised 14 students and oversaw their curriculum that they then took out to the 14 residence halls. There were one per, and a lot of my training around social identities, power, privilege, and oppression kind of kicked in there. Um, I was also coordinating um, a racial justice retreat called Racial Aikido. We, Oregon State University has a collection of racial justice retreats, racial Aikido, multiracial Aikido, examining white identity, International Student Social Justice Retreat are the four. 
and I was coordinating racial Aikido. So there's some of that kind of background as well. And I was also gender specific, I suppose. Um, I sat on like a trans task force on campus where I was representing my department and my unit um, to go with other folks across campus to talk about um, issues that trans folks on campus are experiencing to see how the advocacy can land in each of our departments and units. Um, and I was helping to um, brainstorm to create a, a pride floor living learning community. So something for LGBTQ students and folks who want to support LGBTQ students um, in the residence halls. That's kind of what I was doing there. Um, within my PhD program, um, you know, having a background in a master's of education and then going into a PhD in women, gender, sexuality studies, I had a lot of feelings around what I needed to be studying, right? Like what the right answer was. And I was like, oh, it's policy, <laughs> right? Like that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to like figure out how to do feminist policy or gender-based policy in higher ed. That makes sense. Um, and so I kind of ended up going through this like cycle of like that's how I entered the space because I felt like that was most valid. Um, and I think we all go through cycles, like iterations of development over and over again. Because I had learned my lesson, right? Like in undergrad, I had came in thinking I was gonna be a math major and like I was just gonna go to class and then I went through this thing um, and I came back to a development of like, this is what I should be doing in grad school. And then I did it again the second time for grad school, right? So this idea of policy, feminist policy, um, my first term in grad school, we were reading a lot and I was trying to write this paper. The way my program works is that there's usually one large paper you're working on for the whole term. We have 10 week terms. Um, you have little papers every week and you have one big paper you're working towards. And I was working on that big paper and I thought it was gonna be about gender-based policies in higher ed, like gendered spaces. And um, it was clunky and it was awkward and it was hard and it was too big and I wasn't sure what I was doing. But I was really inspired in the classroom. Like I was true, like I was like, this isn't matching what's happening. I was really inspired in the classroom by the conversations that were happening, by the readings that we were doing, and it just wasn't finding itself in my paper. And so I was like, okay, way too far into the term. I was like, let's see how we can recalibrate this paper. Um, and I looked back through all my notes and the margins of my books and what books I was leaning towards more than others. And I noticed I wanted to write a book about my family, like my family, my my grandmother, my dad's mom. Well, actually, once I landed on that one morning, I wrote, um, I wrote nine pages single spaced in one sitting. I just wrote, and I wrote all of these things, and all of a sudden, something clicked. Was like I'm learning about institutional policy. I'm learning about how the institution, how the state how like the federal government and the literal state and policies and borders create people's experiences. And it's not just people's experiences, it's my family's experiences. And I wrote, like I just like dumped everything that I had ever taken in from my family, familial stories, things that I've heard and just started connecting them to all these readings. And it just like, just like threw itself up, right? Like this was waiting to happen. And that was way too long of a paper to continue to write. So I honed it in a little bit to focus on my dad's mom, my mama, um, and her story in the United States, um, and her story, I'll say her story. Um, and so the paper that I ended up with was called 95 Years of the, 95 Years of Institutionalization of My Family, or something like that. And my grandma at the time was 95, she turned 96, two weeks ago. She's alive and amazing. So what I did is um, I, I tracked in this paper the trajectory of her life, so from when she was born to my dad being born, my dad until I being born, until I was born, um, and then myself until being in the classroom writing this paper. And I tracked all of the moments, and not all of them even, I had to choose all of the moments that the state, the federal government, policies, presidential administrations, um, borders, um, um, propaganda, like all of these things um, impacted our lives, right? And I, I used this metaphor in one of the books that I was reading was actually written by a faculty member of my department. So if you're thinking about going to PhD, like 
or grad school, go somewhere where you're like really excited to work with the people who are gonna be teaching you. Um, that's a big thing. I love my faculty. I think they're brilliant and they're some of the coolest people I've ever met. So, anywho. Um, one of my faculty members is Dr. Coley Driscoll and they had written this book called The Segi Stories, which is about reading history to find um, like queerness, like queer presence, right? Um, that if we lean on history books that were written by colonizers, then we can imagine that their colonization of queer bodies and queerness is within the lines of our history books. And they use this metaphor um, of a double woven basket throughout their book. And the idea is that in a double woven basket, there's actually three baskets. There's an inside basket, an outside basket, and the basket between the basket walls that nobody sees. And so I use this metaphor um, to talk about the last 95 years and my family and the state. So the idea was that the outside basket was the way that the last 95 years would be told by the state, how they say stuff happened, right? Policies, laws, why they were needed. The inside basket um, was my, my, my family and how they received the last 95 years, the trauma, the violence, the resiliency, the resistance and that I was in that in-between space between them. Um, somebody who, who has been institutionalized in higher ed, somebody who's an administrator in higher ed, somebody who simultaneously critiques higher ed as a system of oppression while recruiting students to go into higher ed, um, and somebody who's inherited a lot of the trauma that my family has experienced, have inherited those stories but didn't experience them myself. Um, and talked about myself, and that was kind of the trajectory of the paper. And I finished that paper and I was like, holy shit, this is brilliant. Um, I had so much fun writing it and exploring. And, and as a part of the first year's cohort, your first term, we do, they do like a, like, you're basically your first paper is your like introdu introduction to the program. And so you, um, it's an open invitation to the program so anybody from any other cohorts are able to come and be your audience and you read your papers out loud, um, like a symposium kind of thing. And I read it and multiple people were crying, including faculty I really respected, right? And I was like, shut up, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> that's really cool that like you're touched by this, you know? Um, and, and people came up to me afterwards and express like, wow, I think we're doing like, like similar work, not similar work, but like tangential. I think we could really, really do well together um, if we sit and do stuff. And, and I think at that point when I was no longer trying to, to do the thing, to, to, to be the right kind of scholar, to, to do the right kind of thing, and I let go and let myself write what I needed to write, um, it, it, it felt good and I was being received by the kinds of peers that I wanted to be received by. Um, in one of those conversations of me struggling through this paper, um, one of my peers, I was like, oh my gosh, this paper is so hard and it's so difficult and I don't know. And they were like, what is your biggest fear? Like, what is your biggest fear around this? Can you say it? Can you say it out loud? And I was like, I just fear that I'm gonna write this paper and the faculty are gonna think I'm like not smart and they're gonna kick me out, right? That's my fear. And my cohort mate was like, um, you're in. <laughs> They're not going to kick you out. That would look really bad on them. <laughs> they want you to succeed. Write whatever you want. You're in. There's nothing they can do now. Just write whatever you want. Figure it out. And, and when I told them, they were like, what are you wanting to write? What did you think you were? And I kind of explained to them that trajectory of like, I thought I wanted to write about feminist policy, but this is where this new paper is going. And they were one of the first people to reflect back to me like, yo, you're hella talking about feminist policy, though. Like, you are talking about policy in a feminist way. You're, you're doing like a critique, like a feminist critique of policy in a very feminist way. You're talking about it from the perspective of your family, the perspective of history, the, the perspective of, of this like elder in your community in a specific way. Like, you're actually doing it, right? And I was like, I am. <laughs> I am doing it, right? And this, this cycle, right, of like, I was trying so hard and I had to do, I had to do the hard stuff to get there. Um, I didn't know where getting there would lead me, but it's been very beautiful. And it has felt like every term since then has been that way. Because um, so far I've taken like a core course and then um, a, a smaller course. I'm going to take off my blazer in a second because it's incredibly hot up here. Um, um, and so every every term I write like one big one big core paper, and and that's what the experience is like. I, I feel like I've started of like 
every single term, knowingly, I've been like, this is the paper I must write this term. <laughs> and, and every term, it catches me again and is like, no, no, that's not the paper. And, and it's been great. It's been a great learning experience. Um, going to school full time feels like a great honor to be able to explore a lot of those things. In one of my interviews with my mama, she had said something along the lines of like, my grandma's brilliant. Oh my God, she's so smart. She's 96, but she's quick and she like, she knows details. She can tell me dates, like dates. And she measures her life in presidents. Like she'll, so she'll tell me something that's happening. Like she'll tell me a story and then she'll know who the president was at the time. And she shit talks them usually. And uh, she also shit talks my dad, right? Like, um, and like all of her kids. And she's just smart and, um, and brilliant. And I could talk about her all day. So, anywho. Um, so, one of the things that she had said in one of my interviews with her was um, I wish I could write a book for each of the lives I have lived. That was something she said. And, and I say interview, and it was really just like me talking to her with like the phone recording, right? Um, which is probably not like an, anywho, we're talking. And she says this, and I'm immediately overwhelmed, right? And I'm like, I'm, I'm writing those, though. Like, I get that you're not, but you're telling me this, and like, I'm a, I'm a tiny piece of you. That's how like ancestors work, but it's also like how biology works, right? Um, like, you had my dad, and my dad had me, and we're, we're writing this. You're telling me stories, I'm capturing them. Everything you went through, everything my dad went through, and everything I've gone through to this point, we're writing them, we're writing those stories. And to go to school full time um, truly feels that way. Um, I feel incredibly inspired by my program. Don't go to grad school if you're not inspired. If you think it's what you need to do, don't do it, because grad school's miserable. That grad school's horrible, it hurts. <laughs> Your ego is just like out the window and you'll be told you don't know how to do anything. <laughs> by everything around you but if you're inspired you're like yeah this shit sucks but I'm hella excited right <laughs> um, like yeah I didn't do that paper right but I feel really great about it um and it feels and it feels good right um and it still sucks so if you're not inspired please don't go because it can be really hard on your spirit it can be really hard on your idea of success um it just mess you up the way you're inspired okay um that was tangential anywho um i feel an incredible honor to be able to spend my time exploring these stories and writing these stories in my phd program um in addition to that this is something i'm just starting to talk about now that i've been doing it for almost a year it'll be a year in december um i haven't felt comfortable talking about it yet but it's something i've been doing that is very gender specific i'm on a facilitation team um that goes to Oregon State Correctional Institution, which is a men's prison in Oregon, every week. And we um, facilitate a dialogue group called CAGED, which stands for Creating, CAGED, Creating, what the heck? Oh, Creating Allyship for Gender Equity Through Dialogue. Um, and that feels like really powerful work. So it's, it's in a men's prison doing gender equity work. Um, and that feels incredibly powerful to consider. Um, that's probably the most overt gender specific thing I do. The reason I haven't really started talking about it is because I don't want it to be something that I feel like I can capitalize on. It doesn't feel right. Uh, I still am wrestling with a lot of my own feelings around it. Sometimes I leave those spaces and it's brilliant, but I leave there feeling really great. And I'm like, why do I feel really great? You know, it's really complicated, like a wrestling feeling. Like, I wanna, I wanna, it makes me wanna take a more careful look at my own life and how I move through the world. Literally, like, pushing buttons to cross the street is like weird, right? When I get to go and create relationships with men who are in prison um, and within this institution, it doesn't always feel great to sit on that, um, I don't know, conundrum, right? And so I haven't felt like I could write about it yet. I haven't wanted to get graded for it. Right? I haven't wanted to submit something and receive something for it just yet. Um, but I was talking with Don yesterday, and I had told him that I was doing that, and he was like, shut up, there's so much there. <laughs> like We were talking about it, and I, and I shared that not only are there things around institutions, right? Like I'm studying institutions. I'm studying feminist change within institutions, and like the prison system is like a massive, really overt, explicit microcosm of how we view people, how we view human mm -hmm. subjugation, how, how we use laws as punitive, like all of these things, right? Um, power dynamics are incredibly overt, like all of these things. 
And so there's that whole idea of it. But when people hear that I, when people hear that I do this, I want to talk about all that stuff. I want to talk about the curriculum that I do. I want to talk about the men that I've met. I want to talk about the brilliance that I've heard. I want to talk about what it's like. I, all of those things. But the question I usually get first, can you guess what question I usually get first when I tell people I work at a men's prison? Aren't you scared? Aren't you scared? Aren't you scared? What is it like? What do you mean you go into a men's prison? Are you safe? Uh, do, do the guards go with you? Right? No. No, I'm not safe. No, I'm not scared. No, the prison guards don't go with me. And I'm not alone, but it is. You know, when I agreed to do it, I didn't realize that I would be, um, I don't know what I thought. <laughs> I don't know what I thought. Um, I don't know what I thought. But when we went in, we went in through like the workers entrance, right? You go in, you get scanned in. Uh, in the beginning, I was just a volunteer, so I'd have to be read this incredibly threatening statement every time I went in. I was like, all of these things can happen. Kidnapping, murder, rape, all these things will happen. Are, and then they have to get my um, informed consent, right? Like, I have to say, yes, I still want to go in. They're like, okay. And then they send you to the next gate, and then they check you again there, and then they send you to the next gate, and then you're just in prison. You're not, like, being escorted into, like, uh, an area. You're, like, in the hallway, and we go at about between 5 and 6. So either men are going to dinner or they're leaving dinner. And so they're just walking in the hallway, and you're just, like, in the hallway. And it's, like, school. It looks – it's there's also a whole bunch of other conversations that I would love to have about how this room looks like prison, mm -hmm. how the hallway looks like prison, how my high school looked like prison, or rather how when I went into the hall – when I went into the prison, I was like, shit, where my high school? Um, <laughs> that's a whole – that's a whole – that's a whole other conversation. But my body in the space, like, I'm a, I'm a pretty, like, small human. I'm generally a feminine person. Um... Um, I'm one of two women on the facilitator team. Our facilitator team is six people big. Um, and there's three, no. No, that's not right. There's seven people big. There's um, four outside facilitators, three inside facilitators that make up the facilitation team. And there's only two women. Um, there are some um, women um, in the prison who identify as trans women um, who are sometimes participants but they are not a big fan of necessarily the dialogue space all the time so um, so we're usually the only women in the room and and it's an experience it's definitely an experience for my own body right like realizing like when I go and say it's, and it's on Sundays so sometimes on Sundays I'll be like you know out at brunch or, like doing whatever and I'll look like this and then before I leave I have to like pull my hair back, I take off my makeup, I take off my jewelry, I have to wear baggy pants, um, I have to wear pants, they have to be baggy, um, I'm not allowed to wear all kinds of things, I'm not allowed to wear like a bra, I'm not allowed to have on any clothes that would be perceived as tight, I'm not like, I'm not allowed to wear certain colors, certain patterns, all these things, um, so it becomes this like almost like reverse ritual, right, or a ritual in itself in that I'm like undoing myself, you drive all the way there, you go through a gate, you go through another gate, you get to the gatehouse, you go into the gatehouse, you go through another security, and another security, and it's like this process of being in the space um, that I think is also its own microcosm of interacting with institutions. Like, I could probably give that metaphor to college. I could give that metaphor to all kinds of things of, of how we prepare ourselves and let go of ourselves and adhere to things for successful safety within institutions. Cool, so I do that. Um, tell us about a typical day for you. That's a little hard. Um, I quit my job on Thursday and then I technically, am, the today, yesterday was my very first day within my new graduate student contract. So I have a graduate teaching assistantship, so I'm on contract. And, but I let my faculty know that I would be here for a couple days and they were okay with that. Um, so I don't know what my daily schedule looks like. Before it was very like nine to five, nine to six, meetings, uh, supervision, staff meetings, lunches, stuff, working on the college campus. Um, now uh, it'll be classes and meetings and working with students. I'll be teaching a class and I'll be taking classes and I'll be working for an academic journal on campus. Um, so also work, just different kind of work. Let's see. And it's, what is one thing most challenging for you, post-grad, most enriching? Um, all of it. I think when you graduate, you think you're done learning. 
right? I remember when I was getting really close to graduating from Sonoma State, um, I'm a really big planner person. And I remember the day that I got to like my last planned week at Sonoma, like the end was graduation. The Saturday and my weekly planner was graduation. I was like, shit, there's nothing that comes after that, right? There's like nothing. That is wild. That is wild. I did it. And I had this like moment, very naively maybe, but I remember having this very transformative moment with myself being like, I've learned everything there is to learn. <laughs> I, I shit you not. There's probably a Facebook post somewhere that says this. <laughs> that's like... And to some extent, like, I, I, came, I, I came here to do something and I did it, right? I took the classes, I did the GE thing, I did the upper, upper division thing. Um, I'm going to graduation, I'm graduating. So to some extent, absolutely, I did what I came to do. But I truly believe, like, I've learned the things, right? And I was going to grad school immediately after that, so that's whatever. But maybe that summer, you know, I saw stuff to learn. And then even after graduating from my master's, um, I feel like every graduate program since then, every schooling since then, after college maybe, the learning is like, oh shit, I don't know anything. <laughs> like, that becomes more and more clear, you know, instead of like being really solidified, like I've learned the things. Um, on my master's, I was like, ah, oh, I don't know that I know all of this, I'm not sure. And now I'm just like, yeah, there's, there's, there's no way I would know everything. There's no way, there's no way. Have you ever seen the end of somebody's paper and all of those damn resources at the back? They read those and then those readings have those. Like who's reading all of this? Nobody's reading all of this, right? <laughs> there's no way that somebody could know all of this. Um, and so like more and more and more, I just, all I know is that I don't know anything and that I will never know it all. And that like a PhD is just so you can know like something very specific. And that PhD is really about the journey of learning and cultivating and creating scholarship um, and a year from now that answer will probably change too as I have learned um, it's all horrible and it's all great if you're inspired okay that's the answer in this current political climate do you find yourself drawing upon your WGS background in any way yes all of it have you watched the news um, <laughs> if you had to tell graduating seniors current WGS students one piece of advice what would it be Oh, you were supposed to ask this, my bad. It's okay. Okay, cool. Um, um, okay, this sounds super, like, woo. But um, your dreams are possible. You just have to be, work, like, willing to work really hard to find it. So people always ask me, like, Karina, you know, what are you going to do after you graduate, you know, with this degree? Um, I'm like, I don't know. And people are really uncomfortable with that answer. But the idea is that I don't, I don't know what there is. When I started my master's, I didn't know there was gonna be a gender and sexuality coordinator role at the hub at Sonoma State University. I didn't know that, right? Um, even when I was here, I didn't know that I would be able to work with my mentor. There wasn't a plan, right? Um, when I started my PhD, I thought I was gonna be talking about policy, and now I'm talking about policy, but in this whole different way. I don't know what there is yet, but I've surrounded myself with really great mentors and faculty that mentors of mine who know what I do know what I'm practicing, know my value orientation with things, send me things now. And they're like, hey, just so you know, um, here's a position description for a job. Not that you can apply to it, but just so you know, you're qualified for this. You will be qualified for this, right? And one of the ones I re recently received was um, like to do diversity and social justice work for higher education on a state level, for like the state of Oregon. And my mentor was like, you're, you would be very qualified for this. And I was like, shut up. <laughs> One, who are these people that do these jobs already? Two, I would have never known that. And three, thanks, right? Um, <laughs> I think it's like you kind of, and what I mean by like your dreams are possible, what I mean by that is like, I wanted to be a gender lawyer in the eighth grade. That was my dream. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't have language. And obviously I'm not a gender lawyer. But I do, in many ways, feel like the air, the air of that advocacy, that energy that I was seeking is happening. Like, I do that work, right? I advocate on behalf of gender stuff, on sexuality stuff. Um, I go into spaces and do that work and very much feel like I'm fighting that fight. It's not a gender lawyer, but it's that fight, it's that dream. And so, whatever your dream is, you can do it if you want. Like if you have a, a like a niche, a niche thing that you want to do, it is possible. But you have to be okay with not knowing. You have to be okay with creating those things for yourself. You have to be okay with letting people know things, right? Like as an eighth grader, you don't know hu like 
you don't know humility and shame in similar ways, right? So I was just energized and I turned to the people I trust the most, my parents, and was like, I want to be a gender lawyer, right? And I was able to share that passion. But as we get older, we kind of gain this callous filter around that and are fearful to share our passions and our dreams with folks around us as we're afraid that they might feel naive or um, inaccessible in some way. So I would strongly advise that you find those people that will flourish that, right? That will um, nourish that for you. Like my mentors who I tell like, I don't know what I wanna do, but I wanna do this, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, cool. Here's this position description for that actually. <laughs> like I don't know that, but if I didn't share those dreams with folks, I wouldn't be able to see those possibilities. I also received some questions um, about some of my writing, specific, and then some of that, that piece that y'all read um, around consent and training and qualifications. I also received a question, do you think that obtaining a master's degree prior to entering PhD, a PhD program was beneficial? Um, it was required. So a lot of, so my PhD program in particular requires a master's degree, and it's so that they can, they can help um, guarantee a soft guarantee, but it's a guarantee, um, that you graduate in four years. So in order to do that, they need everybody to have a master's degree so that they can work on that process. Um, do you think you could have immediately entered your program upon obtaining your BA SSU? No. Um, I know people who did in other fields, and I imagine that there are programs that would be able to. Um, for me, no. So much of my inspiration comes from working within an institution of higher ed. Um, I have, I've, I've seen peers of mine who have gone straight through, who did like undergrad, master's, PhD. And um, they, don't, they don't have as much foundation to stand on sometimes. Um, you know, they, they challenge things without feeling what it feels like to go into a meeting where you're the only person that's there for the, the diversity thing um, and to challenge systems of institutions in your face, right, like in their face and say what this long game fight and advocacy is for. They don't have any of that experience and I think it's really difficult. Um, I can't imagine what their experience is like gonna be on the other side of this to speak to those experiences that they don't have. I'm sure there are other programs though that would set you up successfully to do so. I'm just not familiar with them. Um, other questions? Yes, there was more question chase. One more question about my presentation. And then what does your daily life look like as a full-time PhD student? I told you a little bit about that. I don't really know yet. What obstacles or oppressions do you encounter and how do you counter back? Um, I'm usually, usually like I do a lot of the like, I'm the only person of color. That is so true. Um, I'm usually the youngest person in a room or perceived to be the youngest person in a room. Um, 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 this idea of having a specialization that other people need, like I was hired to do something, you've invited me to a meeting because you want that perspective, and then you want to challenge me the whole meeting, right? <laughs> and like, okay, I don't get it. Why was I invited to this meeting then? Um, or like expressing those, you know, if we're, we're talking about something and I'm presenting from this feminist, queer, social justice perspective, and then at the end of it, you want to come up to me and be like, you seemed really overwhelmed, you seemed really emotional. Um, I just wanted to make sure you're okay. I'm like, and then having to do like the PR thing, like having to learn the like, interesting, no, I'm invested. Uh, I think we could all afford to be a little bit more invested. <laughs> right? Um, and so doing some of that, I think is, is often what I'm experiencing. If you're interested in learning more about what it feels like to be like the only kind of stuff, Sarah Ahmed's work is really great. Um, if you haven't already read some of that stuff, that's my go-to, cool. Um, Karina, I wanted to say one thing about, I wondered if you wanted to speak a little bit to your, I know there's not much time, but your experience when we came back here to Sonoma State and worked for the hub, in the sense of what you were just saying as being the only in the room, because I recall, I don't think we were, we weren't HSI at that point yet, or just getting it right, so, and administratively for sure. I just remember, you all should know, like she wreaked havoc. Like we heard about the impact of Kahina in these meetings because she did not shy away from calling all these people out. Mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just ask a lot of questions that make people uncomfortable, or like I tell people like this isn't okay. You know, like when people when people 
try to there's so many stories there's so many stories of what I've experienced and how I didn't let it slide right like there have been times I was in meetings where I was asked to be there and the person leading the meeting actively disengaged while I was talking like it was my turn to talk and they actively sat back and looked at their phone and scrolled and then two people later was like hey where are those updates about that one part and I was like you mean the part I shared and he was like yeah this quicker this time and literally snap bullet points this time and I literally was gonna re I read through everything not bullet points and every time he tried to look away I waited I waited and nobody intervened there were other people of color and there were other women and nobody intervened this moment right there were things like that that I was like would not have would not have and that person attempted to talk to my supervisor about that you need to talk to Karina about things that's <laughs> one I'm a professional staff member you could have came to me to engage in that conversation with me about that incident Two, let's talk to your supervisor what are you doing at me I didn't say that to him but I said it to my supervisor um, um, I was like can you talk to his supervisor what the heck that's a very small instance but other times where, where folks have wanted to do the same thing we do every year oh we do this survey we'll do this we'll do this we'll do this right this institution and the other one where I'm like how about we don't <laughs> how about we try something new you know and people are like that's just like that's a lot and like yeah I'm asking us to do a lot like I'm asking us to do more I'm asking us to commit right and people are just like what <laughs> <laughs> the Pikachu emoji you know or like a Pikachu <laughs> meme like what um what do you mean you want us to commit more to like ethical diversity and that's what my article was about right some of the questions i got and some of the feedback i've gotten about it i was angry in that paper i had to learn about a lot of stuff i went back and read it because some of your questions were about it and i hadn't picked it up in a while but i was angry when i wrote that i learned a lot of stuff i was doing a lot of um work around consent and i had been hearing stories from students i had been hearing stories from administrators that were horrible stories horrible 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 stories and I was angry and that paper was not meant for students that paper was not meant for whatever that was meant for administrators right the context of that journal was for administrators talking about ethics right that's not necessarily an academic paper at all that's an ethics paper it was in the ethics section of a journal and um like F that like no 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 no. what we're doing is not ethical right my paper was very angry before the editors got it um, and the editors helped me like you know rearrange some things um, <laughs> but I still felt my anger when I read that right and it's this demand of like no compliance is not enough right like and oh it's hard work oh is it oh that's super sad yeah let's do more <laughs> um, you can't stand by it it just it just hasn't ever felt like something good when you it's like, yes, I won't hold account I won't hold everyone accountable to knowing everything and knowing more all the time, but when we know more, we should respond accordingly. You should always um, there's I think there's an Audre Lord quote, maybe that's like, do more no, it's a Maya Angela quote. That's like, do the best you can until you know better, and when you know better, do better. Right? Um, and that's how I feel about things. Um, and I make friends so that when I make waves, I don't get in trouble. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.